Hey everybody, welcome to the IPFS local and offline collaboration call. It's January 15th. Um, we have a couple of things on the agenda today, um, but the, the primary one of which is hearing a little bit about Nico's work with Libre Router and the sort of community mesh networking projects they have going, which we'll learn more about. I have a couple other topics we can get to if we have time. So welcome everybody. Let's just do a super quick round of intros for anybody who's newer to the crew. I can get us started. My name's Terry. I work at um, Protocol Labs and I run ProtoSchool, which is a educational community and website uh, tutorials, interactive tutorials on decentralized networking protocols. So a lot of the content is about IPFS right now. And I also organize Offline Camp, which is an event not specific to DWeb, but to Offline First more broadly. Um, so that's my, my connection to all of this, and I run this call. I'm going to go around on my screen, so Lytle, you're up next. Hi, I'm Lytle. Uh, my real name is Marcinate, but everyone calls me Lytle. Uh, I work at Protocol Labs, and I work on IPFS in web browser, usually, and some other stuff like helping with GUI applications and uh, offline use cases are close to my heart, so I'm here. Awesome, and Jonathan? Um, hi, I'm Jonathan Dehan. Um, I am in a couple of different communities, but right now most active on Scuttlebutt um, and a little bit on Mastodon, and I, uh, I work with artists in, and uh, offline communities in New York, mostly. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. And John, thank you to offline camp. It's very exciting to get to meet him in person. Trent, you're up. Hi, I'm Trent Larson. I work at Medici Land Governance, where we're trying to bring secure land rights, especially to the developing world. And a lot of us are excited about uh, things like uh, cryptocurrencies and any kind of distributed systems to help, especially when there's customary land and informal land. Cool. Thanks, Trent. Giannis, you're next on my screen. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Giannis. Uh, I am an academic at uh, University College London and also a researcher at Protocol Labs. Um, and yeah, local offline communications have been a very favorite topic for more than a decade now. So I'm interested to hear about new developments and interests of other people. Awesome. Thanks, Giannis. Nico, you are last on the list for intros and first for actual topics. You can flow right from one into the other. Thank you, Terry. Uh, hi, good afternoon to all. Uh, my name is uh, Nicholas. I am uh, uh, I'm an engineer and a lot of things, but right now I participate in uh, two, three organizations that uh, are relevant to you. The one that I'm going to use my hat on is related to Alter Mundi and it's Libre Router, but also I am the movement building coordinator for the Community Networks Project at, on, at the Association for Progressive Communications and also collaborate pretty often with uh, REDES, that is a Mexican organization that works with indigenous communities, uh, to support them in their exercise of their right for communications. Uh, specifically, I work on the telecommunications part of it. Um, so thank you for inviting me to talk about the Libre Router and how uh, the experience has been. I am really not prepared for this, but, but I put aside some photos to show you. And uh, I actually wanted to bring uh, our attention to a specific concept that I feel that the Libre Router has nailed it. Like, like we, I, I think, like uh, throughout these years of working on community wireless networks and mesh networks. Uh, the community of the Libre Mesh, that is the operating system that the Libre Router uses, has um, uh, developed and uh, nurtured along the way, and uh, I think it has been really good. Uh, so before jumping into this, uh, let, uh, I'm gonna, can I share my screen, Terry? Right. Yes, right? Yeah, you should see a green button at yeah. the bottom middle. Okay, so yeah, do you see it. my screen now? Yes. Okay. 
So for those that don't know, uh, Libre Router, this is the URL, libreroutor.org. It is basically a wireless router, similar to the one that you might have at home or at your job, uh, but uh, it comes embedded from factory for deploying community mesh wireless networks. This means that the, the routers from factory, they know how to talk to each other uh, in order to, uh, uh, as, as you add more routers, you extend the coverage of one single network that covers the whole area where the routers are. Uh, and that means that communities with no technical background can create uh, net networks to serve the, whatever purposes they have. Uh, for a bit of a context, the reason why we are doing this is because in the planet right now, we are around six, seven um, billion people and half of that population, three, around three billion people have no connection to the internet. So half of, the, of our planet is disconnected to the internet. And there's no way right now, no solution, no strategy, no nothing, that in a foreseeable future, those people will be connected. Uh, and all the actors in this area uh, have said that they will not get to them. Um, the growth of internet connectivity has increased for those that are in cities and decreased or, st uh, or stalled at all uh, to those that live in rural areas. Uh, those that are disconnected, 80, I think around 86% of them live in rural areas. Uh, so, and there are, there are, and those that live in rural areas and have no access to connectivity, in general, they don't have access to many things. It's not that they just not have access to internet, but they have their, the rest of their needs sorted out. They don't have access to water, to food, to education, to energy, to many, many things. Uh, so uh, custom, uh, custom solutions and, and for all, uh, solutions that are thought from a human-centered design need, need to be use these uh, areas and the Libre Router is one of those. The, the hardware design is from that perspective and the software design is in that perspective. It's open source so if you're interested into it please dig into it but today I want to put your uh, attention to bring your attention to this uh, geek free approach um, uh, that I think is one of the things that the Libre Router has developed along uh, throughout the years, the Libre Router and it, the operating system that it comes with it, that is called Libre Mesh, has developed. Uh, and it is about uh, usability. I, I'm not sure, like, I'm, I'm not a usability expert or a, a user experience expert, but, uh, and, and we call it geek free, but maybe it's, even, it's already yeah, like UX design. Uh, we saw that the communities uh, don't have uh, disposable, uh, they don't have disposable income, so they, don't, they can't do big expenses, but they don't have disposable time either. So even if they can spend to explore having an, uh, their own network, or even uh, like, or, or like the problem that we have, like offline infrastructure, even if they have the computers and the, the, the cell phones and infrastructure to, to put those services to their use. They don't have time in order to learn new things in order to use what we develop or, to, or, or even to explore what they, what they need or not. So we saw for our own community, because we live in rural areas, well right now I'm in Buenos Aires city, but in general I am in rural areas, that uh, we needed to make it easy for our communities to buy in. For them to be able to understand how it works, to engage with the solution and to have successful, like a, a, 
like a successful feedback from the experience from the first 30 minutes of, uh, of engagement. So let me show you a few pictures. Uh, so, uh, and I haven't sorted them out, so they are gonna be like with no particular order, and I will try to describe them. So, um, the reason why they are smiling, like they, this is one, like they, they were sharing in a feminist gathering how the Liber Router works and how and what the Liber Router is. Uh, they are not part of our collective. Uh, one is a researcher and one is a social uh, social science uh, prof uh, professor. Um, and uh, the reason uh, they, where they were happy is because uh, the, there's a the, cap the possibility. Well, uh, at least this is my understanding of this. Uh, the, there was the possibility for owning the the process. Let me go to something that is more contextual to what I was telling you about. Okay, uh, so you can relate with what I am saying. So this is, uh, you see my screen, right? Yes. Uh, so this, for example, is one of the, a screenshot of one of the interfaces of the system that is used for uh, troubleshooting. Um, so communities use the routers to create a network that they maintain instead of relying on uh, uh, network operator like Verizon or T-Mobile, they create, maintain, and expand their own network. Uh, like your mother or father or my, uh, grandma, like your neighbor that has nothing to do with technology. That's what they do. So in order to do it, they don't not only need to understand how it works, but also they need to be able to troubleshoot it when it fails. This is one of the screens where they troubleshoot it. And it says, so this is the type, the name of the node that, that we are seeing. So the screen, the website that is hosted in one of the routers, uh, and each router has a name. In this, in this case, the name is the name of the owner. And it, it's a couple. So it's Mary, Mary and Javi. Uh, so this is the name of their node. And in this case, they are in a screen. On, uh, they are. Uh, they took a screenshot of a screen that allows them to know how is the connection. What's the path for for what? What are the nodes that they have to go through to go from their house to the internet? And when they get to the internet, how that internet is behaving? Like how how the relation that their network has to the internet is behaving? And in this case, it says, from Mary Javi, the node that they are in, I have to go through Wally, that is some neighbor. Uh, uh, I have an eight megabits per second connection throughput to that neighbor. Uh, and then I get to the internet. And when I get to the internet, it says, I have IP, IPv4 is working okay, DNS is working okay. But it seems that you have an issue with IPv6. So, uh, uh, and this screenshot was taken out of a WhatsApp group that they have when, that they use to troubleshoot their network. Uh, so, this might not be like that significant for us right now. But let me show you another screenshot that I'm seeing right now. So, this is another screenshot. So, this is another neighbor. So it says, this is at Wally's house. Uh, let me see if I can remove, but anyway, I can't remove this thing. Um, there you go. Do you see it there? Yeah. So this is on, at Wally's house. This was in another moment. The best link that they, it has is with Mary Habit. But this screenshot, when, when, they use, when, when Wally took this screenshot, he wanted to, the group, so the rest of the community members that uh, travel should and maintain their network, like layman people, not technicians, to pay attention to one specific thing, the one that he circled with uh, the, the SketchUp on, on, his, on his phone. He said, it seems 
I don't know what I'm looking at. But it seems that th this thing that I'm pointing out in this screenshot is failing, that it has something wrong. And the, the, reason, I, I, and why, the reason why I want to show you this is because, because the user has engaged with the app regularly, they got to know how it behaves. It's the, like they discover the interface as they go through the experience of relating with the technology. Uh, by having um, abstractions that are uh, clear, not uh, 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 at least like this is this is how I see. I mean, I, I, I this these are my thoughts. Like I, I'm thinking out loud. Sorry, uh, just uh, to, to share how I feel about these things. Um, by by having an abstraction that is clear to them and they can relate with it, um, they. Uh, they share their insights, and through sharing their insights, they troubleshoot the, the platform. But, and also uh, because uh, the real, like they, they are in the, their engagement with the solution, the, the, with, the, with the platform, is related to what happens in their physical life. Like in this case, the router was not working, so they went to the app looking for answers and something changed from the last time they saw there in this case there's an x where there should be a, a mark uh, so he pointed that out um, so they also relate a lot with this interface that is uh, an interface that is related to uh, the alignment of the antenna so these wireless routers go outside go outdoors not inside our houses and the antennas are not like the ones that we are used to like the sticks that are on our home routers they are directional so you have to point them in the direction that you want the antenna to connect to the neighbor your name to your neighbor and this number is a, a increases as you uh, uh, the more, the, the higher the number, the better signal you have, and uh, they ex they exchange screenshots to make sure because because not everyone knows how well a signal can be or if a link is well good enough or things like that. They access their collective knowledge by sh by sharing screenshots of what they are looking at. Um, what else can I show you? So. Okay. Uh, another thing that we do, and uh, this screenshot shows a little bit of, about that, is when they engage with technology and the technology helps them be confident about the use of it, they get excited and want to know more. And we get to do things that you don't, we, I mean, we, you don't usually do. In this case, for example, uh, I was in Mexico, uh, and one thing that I haven't told you is that uh, some of you might know me, but uh, I travel around the world giving workshops on how to do these things. Like I, I work with indigenous communities and I travel basically all the time. In this case, it was in Mexico, and uh, the, uh, the 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 guys and girls that are in the photo are from a community in Guatzalan, Puebla. They are indigenous. Uh, and, and they decided to create their own infrastructure. So we started doing a workshop and they wanted to learn how to do the cabling of it. Uh, so once you, like once they see that it's actually something that they could engage, when they, once they see the light on the other side of the tunnel, they can, they, they, it happens more often than not that they choose to do it. They go through it like because they can assess if it's something that they would like to do or not. Uh, and a lot of times happen in technology that because things get complex, uh, making a decision is more a crowd, like a, uh, you follow the crowd that is instead of making your own decisions. So it's important to put, uh, make things simple enough so we can be more conscious about the choices that we do. Uh, in this case, this was the same time, and because uh, the, in this case, Bonnie already made 
his mind about it. Like I was like the, the, those legs that are on, on, on your, on the left of the photo are mine. He was explaining it instead of me. Like once they, because it's something that is simple to understand. I actually have given, uh, uh, I, I will send with, I, I will share with you a recording of uh, one of the workshops that I have given. It's 45 minutes. Like one, with 45 minutes, you understand the whole thing, like from top to bottom. You can go and deploy networks in the whole planet if you want. Um, and that's amazing because with no technical knowledge, you can go from nothing to uh, connecting the whole planet if you want. Um, what else? I wanted to show we have a few screenshots of how the app works. So these are the interfaces. Some of them are difficult to, like for example, this one, we want to work on it. Uh, this is the one that you saw, the connecting to the internet and how to, like the, the bandwidth from one hub to the other. So in this case, in order to get to the internet, you had to go through a lot of people like Marisa, then Cesar, then uh, Oncelotes, then Oncelotes, the, the, uh, backbone, then Citadel America, uh, a lot of hops from one to the next. And you can see how much bandwidth you have from one hop to the other and how well the link is based on the color. For example, let me show you another one that has different colors. Let's see if I find one. I think there's one. I think so. No, there is none. Okay. Um, this is another thing that I wanted to share with you. Maybe another thing that deliver, that this has is like we 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 try to make the network be accessible not only to those that have technical skills or not like not only to deploy the network but also to use the network in ways that we are not used to like in in, in uh, like in our everyday. Uh, activities like for example I'm not sure if well we maybe all of us are tech, we have technical background or uh, technical uh, skills um, but uh, I would say my mother uh, that is an accountant she's not used to deploy services like provide services she she uses internet in a very consumeristic way uh, she might share things on Facebook but she's still consuming Facebook services. She's not providing services. She's using platforms for that. Um, so we made the Liver Router make sense, like make it easy for communities to also be able to have services, local services, because in general the relation to the internet is distant. There's, they are far from where the internet basically is. Uh, so in this case, you can see in the URL that it says Nandu One Radio. Uh, so the Libre router registers the host names of the devices that you connect to the internet and makes those host names available as if they were any other host name, any other URL on the internet. So any computer that you connect to the network that provides a service, so let's say you have a Raspberry Pi and you have a, a blog, that you download it, the micro SD card, micro SD card uh, uh, image of a WordPress server, uh, and you put it on a Raspberry Pi, and you just connect that Raspberry Pi to the network. That Raspberry Pi is going to be accessible on the network by its name, not only by its IP address, uh, and that increases the usability of the network because now you can go to your neighbors and say, go to your browser, put. Uh, Nico's blog and it will appear uh, and and that is in it's in, incredible how much it changes let me show you another picture so this was I, I was in in India a uh, month ago uh, can you sorry, sorry to interrupt can you yeah. elaborate a little bit on how this last bit that you mentioned works uh, exactly so yeah sure uh, it's, it's things by name instead of uh, connecting to an IP address. Sure, uh, and thank you for that. Uh, actually, if anyone wants to interrupt me, I'm completely okay with that. Um, so basically, what happens is uh, the Libre Router is a, a, a set of tools. It's not just a network. So 
uh, the routers with each other. They create a mesh that has that is a layer two network and that layer three network. So it means that you uh, all of the all of the devices that connect to all of the no routers that are part of the same mesh uh, behave as if they were in the same room, although they might be in different parts of the village. Um, and and also and we also control what to do with the different services that run on top of the network. One of the services that we control is the DHCP server. The DHCP servers, for those that don't know, is the one that gives IP addresses to computers that connect to the network. So when a computer connects to the network and asks for an IP address, the computer also tells the, 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 the DHCP server its name. And what we have done is basically the DHCP server will give that computer or phone an IP address to access the network and it will register on the DNS server that also runs on each of the devices, that host name that has given, been given by that new device on the DNS uh, host file. Um, so it can be accessible to all of uh, the devices on the network. That's how it's done. Um, and by the way, everything is open source. Like the open, the so, this open system is full, fully open source. The hardware is open source. So the Libre router hardware is also open source. Uh, and it's accessible on our GitHub account. And I, will share that with you. Uh, I don't know, have I replied to your question? Do you have yeah, any follow-up? Yeah, absolutely, yes, yes, okay. yes, thanks. Uh, so uh, I was in India a month ago. Uh, uh, this girl is called, oh, I, I forgot her name, Shalini, no. Anyway, so she's a 16 year old. Uh, she runs a community radio in her village. Uh, the radio is not an FM radio, it's an internet, well, it, uh, a network radio um, that is hosted in a device that I don't have the picture here, but now she's deploying a mesh network in her village in order for the community to be able to access the radio uh, in the whole village. And she's doing it by herself. She's doing it, uh, she, she, like we were ho holding her hand so she could feel, uh, I, I was holding, like, like uh, holding her hand in, in between quotes uh, in order for her to feel confident, like explaining the process of alignment of the antennas. But basically she was installing this node in her house and that same day, Shalini, uh, this is Shalini, uh, she was installing the other node in the craft space. Uh, hold on, I think I have a picture of the craft space here. No, I don't have a picture of the craft space. So these two routers, uh, through their own, uh, like uh, they learned this like weekend to do this and they deployed a network in their village by themselves using these interfaces and the hardware that they got uh, from us. Um, yes, um, what else? So, and, and they actually deployed this service. This is the number one radio. This is Hadea radio, all in one weekend. Like they deployed the network and they deployed the services and they started broadcasting their network radio by themselves. Uh, near this is near Bangalore in in, in India. Um, okay, let me see if I have any part specific to share with you. So this is the the setup. Well, this is a very bad picture. Oh, here they here this. This is in Spanish. Uh, so the interface is uh, one of the things that we have done is localization. Like everything is in local languages, and it can be localized in indigenous languages. Right now, it's we haven't yet, but uh, we are in the process of doing it in, in some major languages in different uh, countries that we are supporting their process. In this case, it was in Mexico, uh, in Quetzalan, Puebla, Mexico. Uh, okay, let me show you a bit of the other interfaces. 
Let me see if there's something in particular that, that would be valuable to see. Here, for example, it says error. So it means that uh, something was happening within, with that node that though they were able to get to the internet, there was an error that didn't allow them to diagnose what, like the connection, the bandwidth with them. And those are things that allow them to focus their efforts and their energy and their knowledge in the place where the problem was lay, lying. Uh, okay, here there was, there's another one. Um, in this case, uh, the, the app has also uh, mapping, so they can know where everyone is and who is connected with who. And in this case, they were saying, okay, there's this, this, uh, so they have to locate the, the, the nodes in a map. Um, each node in their own map. Uh, and in this case, the node was in the wrong place. They, it should be where the green one is, where when it was in the blue one. So they were also diagnosing a mislocated uh, node. Um, okay. Uh, so this was a workshop. Another thing is, once, if the technology is accessible, another, so another, another important thing is when we make technologies accessible, we, we make technologies, they can challenge the technology. If they understand how it works, they can discuss about it. They can say, I like this or I don't like that. This was a workshop that I gave uh, in Chiapas, Mexico for community uh, um, journalists. Um, and uh, well, in this case, they were taking a photo of the router. But in this workshop, uh, they they said, "Okay, this this doesn't work in in our city. Like I work in in the periurban area, and we would like to have uh, our own network in a in a slum. But uh, this will not work because of this, this, and that." And they are not technicians. They are not prepared to develop these things, but they, uh, the technology allowed them to challenge it. To say, uh, though I don't know how to do it, I understand how it works, so I can say, I would like it different. And then we can talk about that. Um, okay, I, uh, there are some more pictures. Uh, one of the girls doing alignment uh the the other side doing the like trying to uh, preparing for the alignment uh mm, i don't know yeah there are more pictures i just made a selection but uh if you have any questions uh maybe next time i can bring more insights out of the we are already uh, uh, there are little routers in 17 countries right now more or less uh and the uh, they are, they, it's going to be available, uh, like general availability in a few months, uh, but it's already available for those that want to try and want to help us uh, uh, polish it. Polish it. Uh, it would be super interesting for us, like uh, the the well uh, is uh, paramount, uh, and uh, the unconnected will be the ones that will uh, shift. Uh, the the internet uh, forever like half of the planet is disconnected and the way they will get connected will uh, define how the internet will be in the coming years so uh, we want to go for let's say one tenth uh, uh, like one not one percent one per thousand would be uh, so 30 million people connected through this technology. Um, and um, we want it to be with a D web. So uh, I think we need to reflect about both the infrastructure and also how we, uh, we, we make them, like we, we support them in that process, like how the D web is approachable, but by not only the people that have access to technology already, but also those that are not. Okay. Yeah, I think that the onboarding issue and approachability is one of the biggest problems I see kind of across the D-Web scenario. So I think it's fabulous that you're making something that's very easy to start with and not feel bogged down by 
technical details. I think that the concept of self-hosting and when you get into the vocabulary of the web and federated this and run your own that, it gets very overwhelming. So that's really awesome. Um, I have a question for you about what happens before all of the stuff you've just shown us. Like, how are these communities learning that this is even an option for them and who's paying for the equipment and how much does it cost? Okay. Um, so right now, the communities that have already received Libre Routers um, have known about it through, uh, I would say, mainly through uh, uh, World Aid. So uh, it would be organizations, NGOs, or development agencies that might have gotten the information to them and they got in touch with us. So, uh, a lot has been through uh, the journey. So uh, I have been in person in many parts of the planet uh, in different uh, summits where communities are exploring these things. Internet Society has done an amazing job in doing outreach to those NGOs that have gotten into this topic and um, the community networks movement has been steadily growing though it's still stagnant, uh, like still uh, in, in its infancy. Um, but uh, it has been through the community network advocacy process uh, that uh, most of the people that has got, have gotten written through those knew about it. Um, in relation to how much it costs, right now it costs $170 with uh, shipping uh, included, uh, around $170. Uh, um, it's uh, the number that we use as a ref like a reference, like the number the number that we gave give to the communities for them to think about um, the uh, affordability of it. Uh, we want it to be around a hundred dollars. That's our target, uh, but we're not gonna get there anytime soon uh, because basically the, the reason it's actually a pretty simple uh, thing. Like there's one thing that we don't have that uh, companies have that is scale. Like we don't have upfront money to spend on manufacturing these things. Uh, and we don't have a distribution network that, uh, that creates demand based on the market. We are not a company, we are an NGO. Uh, we are actually a grassroots, we are not even an NGO. Um, so we are not here for the money, we are not getting any, like, uh, any profit from this. Um, so there are all the mechanisms that we are used to have, uh, they are not there. And there's not gonna be a distribution network either because this is not a market that is interesting for the, like for any capital, uh, specific, specific capital. Um, uh, what I see, uh, so communities have paid for it and uh, NGOs have paid for, for it. Right now, uh, the Association for Progressive Communications, uh, like there are two main NGOs that have put money into it, uh, like in purchasing units. Um, a, a, the Association for, for Progressive Communications is one of them, apc.org. And Internet Society has been the other. Like these are the main, the two main buyers right now. Like, but the, this is like in the last three, four months that we have been selling the first units that are basically for uh, un like testing them, like testing them on the film. But it's not available yet. Um, some communities have already started purchasing them with their own resources, so gathering their own money and putting it at the service of this. Um, in Mexico mainly, and Myanmar and India, uh, and Colombia too. Uh, and right now, uh, some of the development agencies, uh, so uh, UN, the United Nations uh, for uh, Refugees, have done an, an, uh, one, the first order, the first purchase of them, um, and we will do a pilot uh, with them in refugee territory. Um, we are also planning to do, so there's something that I feel, I have, I have the guts that might work, that is in relation to uh, uh, 
global aid, but not coming from agencies, but from the layman, like people like you and me, like, like everyday people. Uh, and I think, I, I think that maybe a crowdfunding campaign might gather a lot of people. Uh, so we might be exploring crowdfunding soonish, like this year. Um, but it's and not that would be That would be interesting, because I think you probably have a lot of folks who are passionate about the web, but in much more privileged scenarios, who might be able to afford to contribute to something like that, even though they don't need to be the end user of it. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a question from Trent in the chat about when you expect people to be able to purchase them directly on the website. Can you say that again? Yeah, when you expect people to be uh, able to purchase them directly. Uh, I, I would say two to three months. Uh, yeah, pro, that, that's a, 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 I, I guess it's a very uh, good guess. Uh, yeah. But you, if, you, if you want to get your hands on one of them, you can already send me an email uh, and uh, you, can get, you can get them. We're already selling them. It's, not, it's just we are not doing it uh, right. uh, broadly. Uh, and mainly because what we want is to have more advocates. Like we want more people that want to uh, uh, test it. We, to, uh, I, we have been testing the hardware for almost two years. So we are pretty confident about the outcomes of it. Uh, but um, yeah, as many eyes that we can have, the better. The, many, the, the more eyes, the better. Uh, let me share the screen a little, like one minute more. But just to show you a few links, a few URLs that I will paste in the document. So the, the website's URL, you already have it, liberouter.org. Then uh, at docs.altermundi.net, there are a few URLs. Uh, the texts of the documents in English are in English, but the rest of the site is in Spanish. Uh, and there are a few documents that explain what community networks are, what does it mean to build your own piece of internet? And uh, um, yeah, explains the foundations of it, like what, what it means to build your internet and what it means to build your, like to, to, to what's the internet and how do we make it our own? Uh, in this case, it's more about, uh, and, and what, what it entails, like what, what are the, what's the process? What, what are the challenges? What are the responsibilities that we have to do? Uh, a few documents are still yet to be translated. Um, this one, uh, and, and, there's, uh, and because this is completely related to the, 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 the land that, that we inhabit, uh, some of them are related to understanding our territory and uh, being able to plan what we are going to do. So the, some of the documents are related to community organization, not necessarily to uh, technical things, but we need to understand the some of the technical aspects. There are videos about it, so you will find some videos about in relation to the documents, uh, like this participatory mapping that has a video and a document, uh, or the uh, making the how to make a network cable, and the last document that I wanted to show you is a documentary that we have just released. Uh, that's called Comunidades Haciendo Internet. That will be Communities Building the Internet. Um, that document the experience of uh, Quintana Libre, that is the community that uh, has inspired this all, uh, like all, all of this, uh, and how that community has gone from not being connected to being uh, the inspiration to other communities to follow their steps. Uh, the, the video is in Spanish, but if you go, I don't know if you know about this, a lot of people don't. So if you enable subtitles, then you go to the adjustment, the, the, the settings, and you can ask Google to translate them to whatever language you use. Uh, it happens for us Spanish people, that like uh, Spanish speaking people, that we often need to translate uh, an English video so you can see the documentary 
subtitled in, in English by asking Google to subtitle the video for you. Uh, and it's actually, it's both a very, uh, a very good story and a beautiful documentary. Like it, it has a beautiful images, very good narrative, good music. You will enjoy it for sure. Uh, I will add this link. link. To that in the yeah, sure. Yeah. I will. Uh, hold on. I will, I will actually do it now, uh, so we don't forget. Uh, let me stop this and find the chat. Here it is. This is document. The documentary uh, is this one, uh, and the documentation is docs.altermondi.net. Uh, there you go, and uh, the links to the other videos are there in the documentary uh, page. Okay. Uh, thank you for listening. Do, if you have any other questions, I'm here. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I know Jonathan had one topic that he had in mind. If we have time, we have about 10 minutes left right now. Are there any pressing questions on what we've just been talking about? Or shall we move along? And um, Nicholas, take a look at the chat because there have been a few comments kind of for you that, of things that could help you as you go forward with the project. So I'll let you peruse those. Um, Jonathan, we have 10 minutes left. Did you want to talk to us about the um, community building guidelines? Yeah. Um, th thank you for that, Nico. There's a lot of um, things that I'm going to ask you questions on uh, outside this chat and, and also see if we can adopt more thoughtful interfaces for um, kind of the work we're doing in New York and with NYC Mesh. I think you have some really good implementations. Um, since we only have 10 minutes, I'm not gonna um, dig into it too much, but I'm participating in a project. Um, it's a yet another Scuttlebutt client. Um, called Oasis that is really simple and um, it's like a web-based client. It doesn't have any JavaScript on the client side, so it's really fast, works on a lot of devices, it's low power, um, is surprisingly usable. Um, and we've come up, we found some really interesting, I don't know, tricks for HTML and CSS, but uh, what came up recently um, was the adoption of a uh, and a development process that led me through a rabbit hole um, and it's called the collective code construction contract and I'll share links to it um, shortly uh, it's a little hard because I'm on mobile right now um, but it was built by one of the authors of uh, zero MQ which is a relatively popular um, open source project and uh, you can find the the construction contract on its own. It's pretty short. It's like two pages long. Um, but it's the reasons behind it are embedded in a book called Social Architecture, which is this like six chapter book around um, yeah how how to architect um, social groups. So how to think about scaling communities. Um, and from this, I'm just going to pull up a few things that resonated with me. And hopefully this, you know, since we only have 10 minutes, if any of these ideas um, are super interesting or you've been thinking about, um, we should just follow up in a discussion group or bring it up at another meeting, however you want to do it. Um, yeah. So uh, real quickly, the, the, Number one goal of the construction contract is the size and health of the community. So it's not technical quality or profits or performance or market share or reach. It's just how many people are contributing to the project. Um, this makes it easy to measure the effectiveness of like any of the ideas within it and um, kind of sets the tone. Um, and it's mostly meant for software projects. So again, the scope is not all communities, but I think there are some you know, very software specific ideas in here. And um, we're, going, we're going to accept an implementation of this 
that will, um, we're gonna accept an implementation of this and, and iterate on it, essentially. So to get into the most interesting part for me, oh, I don't have video. I don't think video is necessary, but um, yeah. The one thing that is something that I've been trying to articulate for a while in smaller communities of people who don't identify as technologists um, in uh, art communities mostly is like accepting contributions and that first time being important. So in the CCCC, um, there's a really interesting call out. Um, I'm just gonna quote it. Maintainers may merge incorrect patches from other contributors with the goals of ending fruitless discussions, capturing toxic patches in the historical record and engaging with the contributor on improving their patch quality. I'm gonna skip over A and B because they're kind of weird and I don't understand them that well right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just gonna read through this and if this resonates, let's talk. So it turns out that accepting imperfect patches rapidly or engaging in optimistic merging works better all around than insisting that contributors deliver perfect work. Standard practice or pessimistic merging is to wait until continuous integration testing is done, do a code review, test the patch on a branch, provide feedback, the author can then fix the patch and then test review cycle starts again and the maintainer can make value judgments like I don't like how you do this or this doesn't fit with our project vision. Um, in the worst case, patches can wait for weeks or months to be accepted or they're never accepted or they're rejected with various excuses and argumentation. Pessimistic merging is how most projects works and I believe most projects get it wrong. Um, it tells new contributors that they're guilty until proven is innocent, which is a negative message that creates negative emotions. Um, contributors will just look for alternatives. Uh, it gives maintainers power over new contributors, which many maintainers abuse, and that abuse can be subconscious, but it is widespread. Um, maintainers inherently strive to remain important to their project, and if they can keep out potential competitors by delaying and blocking their patches, they will. I don't think that pettiness really, I haven't um, encountered that in the communities that I've seen, but uh, at least at the scale of zero MQ, they found that a problem. Um, it opens the door to discrimination and it slows down the learning cycle and it gives outsiders the chance to troll the project and it puts the burden on the individual contributors. Um, so to frame this, let's look at four types of contributions or patches. Um, there are good contributors who know the rules that exist already and write excellent, perfect patches. There are good contributors who make mistakes um, and who write useful yet broken patches. There are mediocre contributors who make patches that no one notices or cares about. And there are trollish contributors who ignore the rules and write what he's calling toxic patches. Um, in all four of these areas, pessimistic merging has a worse outcome than optimistic merging. Um, Pessimistic merging assumes that all patches are toxic until they're proven good. Whereas in reality, most tend to be useful and just like, you know, not any contributor is gonna have the full context of a project, but it's worth taking what they do and improving upon it. And finally, um, an example of how the outcomes are better with optimistic merging over pessimistic. Uh, let's say that you have a good contributor who knows the rules and writes a excellent patch. In pessimistic merging, depending on unspecified arbitrary criteria, patch may be merged rapidly or slowly. At least sometimes a good, good contributor will be left with bad feelings. In optimistic merging, a good contributor feels happy and appreciated and may continue to provide excellent patches until they're done you know, with the project. Um, now you have a good contributor who makes mistakes but writes a, a useful and maybe broken patch. They Good contributor retreats, fixes the patch, comes back somewhat humiliated in pessimistic merging and optimistic merging. Another contributor helps them fix their patch and um, just the life cycle of the project is a much greater latency between the idea and like getting it out to people. This goes on and on. Um, we're super pressed for time. So uh, generally what I've found is that 
optimistic merging like gives people responsibility and ownership and creates conditions for mentoring and coaching. And this is like a small slice of the ideas behind what the code construction contract is. But if I was to boil it down to how you get to a healthy community where people are moving from just being um, like a consumer to a producer or taking their own ownership, whatever that means to them, it's divestment of like ownership from the creators and figuring this is just like one way in specifically software projects that we're going to experiment in Oasis in, uh, yeah, divesting our own ownership and found, uh, founder ownership and seeing if that creates a healthy community. So, um, I'd be really interested in seeing in a year from now, all the other kind of like explicit rules we adopt and if they turn out how we think they will. Um, there's a few things we, we've already disagreed about in the com community that like we, we want to adopt for our own. So what's nice is the C4 is a like more of a protocol. It's not like a license. So you, it's kind of a set of criteria. You make an implementation of it and then you iterate on that implementation. So um, this is also like, it reflects how my personal contributions to open source have been. Um, there are projects who have merged, obviously broken patches from me almost immediately. And I have become long time contributors in, in those projects versus ones that have a totally reasonable process and have, you know, understand what it's going for, but we're going to be erring on the side of, um, you know, accepting broken things as quickly as possible to help like, uh, everyone involved really. So that sounds interesting. Let's talk. <laughs> That's an interesting concept. Yeah. It's definitely the, you know, as in kind of D web stuff more generally, that whole process of onboarding and getting started and feeling like you're participating in a community really requires some open arms to, <laughs> to help you get in there. And you make a great point about the, you know, there are people who are willing to contribute to projects like on GitHub. There are, there are plenty of people whose um, skill set might be in like amazing writing or things like that, mm -hmm. where they could make a lot of contributions to a project that aren't the technical stuff, but then they're in GitHub land trying to make those contributions in a way that's unfamiliar and all of that stuff. So welcoming people with a broad background is awesome as well. Yeah, we, we found that like having these implicit rules are really bad. If you've ever um, read The Tyranny of Structurelessness, it's a great um, article that kind of brings about the reason for even putting this down for being a signal of like, here, here's what we recognize exists already. So we can talk about it so we can improve it, like allowing um, uh, n like non-code contributions. Um, and also part of C4, it actually cuts out a lot of features of like the tools that we use inc and including like, um, like Git branches are not to be used. Um, I, I I should have had my video on for that, but basically um, reducing the burden of learning a lot of tools for those who don't need to, we're in the depth of those tools to contribute um, is the theory behind that. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I so I took some notes as you spoke, but if you don't mind going back into the doc later and dropping in any relevant links, that would be great. Yep. Any quick questions for Jonathan before we say goodbye? Cool. Well, thanks for sharing. And thanks yep. to Nicolas also. That was really cool to see the work that LibreRouter is doing. Um, and we've added many, many links to the notes from today's call. So feel free to go check those out if you want to learn more. And is it okay to pop your I saw you shared your email address. Oh yeah, it's in there. Okay, perfect. So Nico's contact information is also in the notes if anyone would like to get in touch directly for more details or to help with testing, et cetera. Cool, well, it's great to see you all. I'm just looking at the calendar quickly. So in February, our third Thursday, oh, Wednesday. That's why I won't come up on my calendar. Yep, so third Wednesday, so February 19th will be our next call and I will update 
the same um, GitHub issue that we use. So if anyone's not already doing it, if you watch the GitHub issue for this call, then you'll see the conversation about topics coming up next and reminders of when the call happens. So please feel free to do that or check out the repo in general at more issues for discussions, et cetera. Can, can you share the um, link to the notes in the GitHub issue too? Yes, they're in there. So that when you oh, see okay. a link to agenda, it's the agenda slash notes are all the same document. So in the issue, it'll be there. But when I send, I'll send out a little recap and I'll, I'll re-highlight those. And I will just right now in the chat paste uh, oh, I see. to the GitHub issue also. So, oh. And then this is link to the notes. Cool. All right, great to see everyone today. And I look forward to seeing you next month and chatting in between about cool stuff that you're working on. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye. Thank you.